Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this next webinar of the Climbus Europe platform. Today we have with us uh, Markus Dietmannsberger. He is uh, head of zero emission drives at Ham Hamburg and Hochband. And we will be uh, discussing on the topic of how to operate clean buses successfully. Short presentation, but Marcus, thanks a lot for, for being our speaker today. Uh, Marcus is already working with Hochbahn since 2017. He has uh, been the responsible manager for the electrification process of uh, Hamburger Hochbahn. He, as I said, is uh, the head of zero emission free drives and sector coupling since 2020. And he is going to be guiding us today through this uh, fascinating topic. Um, the, mon the, the, the most important points we will be going through today, uh, perhaps just uh, it's, uh, it's a very nice uh, complete agenda, but just to highlight perhaps uh, yeah, how uh, Hamburger Hochbahn has uh, defined uh, his, its path no? to, the, to the zero emissions uh, goal, uh, what happens when different technologies can be considered, what were the challenges, also a bit on the costs. CO2 balance and of course uh, the integration with uh, with the overall scheme thinking globally no, and social sustainability. A short reminder for how we uh, run these webinars, uh, please per default mute yourself. Uh, you can use the chat to place your questions, but of course also raise uh, your hand and make us aware that you would like to have the word. Uh, again, a reminder, this session is being recorded and we are very happy to welcome you today and we count on your contribution to make this a successful workshop. Thanks a lot. And I will give now the floor to Marcus and we can start the webinar. Thanks a lot. Here you go, Marcus. Thank you very much, Aida, for the invitation. <clears throat> and thank you all for being interested in what we do here in Hamburg. I just try to share my screen now. You should see the presentation now. We do. You do. That's good. Um, yes, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and uh, I can only um, ask for questions uh, to be asked because otherwise I will simply talk forever and ever. And yeah, maybe some of you might think this is um, better when we have a discussion and I do so as well. So I will have a lot of topics um, as Aida already pointed out in the agenda. And uh, I'm very happy to discuss the uh, one or the other issue issue if you want to have a discussion on it, and then we can address your your questions uh, very briefly. I'm not sure if I can see raised hands here because I only have the laptop screen, so um, we'll will support. We will find a solution for this yeah. Okay, so then let's start. Um, first of all, I would like to give you a short uh, introduction to what the Hochbahn is actually doing re with respect to the buses here in Hamburg. We also operate the metro system, but basically on buses uh, is what we're talking about today. Then we're going from the very global mission that we have here in Hamburg um, and the way we are choosing for our road to zero emissions. And um, then we will dive deeper into the issues. A few years ago, everybody was very keen on the question battery versus hydrogen. We can have a small discussion on this or not. We can take it briefly, we'll see. And then we, I'll come to the challenges um, that we have seen and still face in the future on our way to zero emissions. And uh, I think most of you might be interested in some figures on costs and CO2 balance. And um, in the end, <coughs> try to conclude um, with, a, is, with an issue that's, that's very important for me personally, um, that we find a global sustainable solution and not just a local sustainable solution um, with, with respect to zero emission, but also to child labor and so on. So this is the outline. Um, let's start just briefly what the whole bond figures are in Hamburg. So at the moment we have uh, around nine bus depots depots with uh, roughly 20 hectares. So those of you who have been to Hamburg, there's a big festival three times a year and uh, all depots together uh, have the, uh, roughly the, the grounds of the Hamburg Dome festival. And those nine depots at the moment cover up to 1,100, maybe 1,200 buses. <clears throat> and those of you who know the Reeperbahn here in Hamburg, which is uh, maybe the most important or most uh, famous thing in Hamburg, um, a comparison to all our solo buses, uh, articulated buses and even 
extended articulated buses. They all strung together. It's about 20 times the length of the Ripperbahn. And uh, those figures are increasing. So uh, in Germany, or especially in Hamburg, um, the increase of public transport uh, has been uh, uh, announced a few years ago. So we assume that our uh, figures will increase up to 1,400, 1,500 by the beginning of the 2030s or something. And uh, around 600,000 passengers uh, a day are transported by our buses. Why do I uh, highlight this? Um, I highlight this because in Hamburg we only have the metro system and the bus system. We don't have a light rail system, um, which is always the system in between of the big and the small uh, systems, the big at the metro and the small as the bus system. We don't have this. It was a political discussion a few years ago, uh, and thus our bus system is quite huge um, compared to the overall tra uh, public transport. And that's why we address this figure in order to outline that, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, public transport is relying on buses here in Hamburg. Um, then I uh, step aside uh, a bit from the original public transport um, and try to give you an insight on the um, ownership structure here in Hamburg. So <clears throat> the key stakeholders, let's say, here in Hamburg, which are important for the electrification of our bus fleet, are all owned by the city of Hamburg. So obviously the Hochbahn and the Verkehrsbetriebe Hamburg-Holstein, which is kind of a sister to us, um, uh, operating the buses surrounding Hamburg, but also a, a share of Hamburg. So they are only uh, they are roughly 50% of our size in buses. Um, we are both publicly owned, and more important for what I'm talking about uh, the next minutes, Stromnetz Hamburg, which is the electric grid operator here in Hamburg, is also. Um, uh, owned by the city of Hamburg. So most important stakeholders that are important for us to the electrification are all under one roof, let's say. And uh, if there is a political will and agenda, then sometimes things are easier to be managed, as we will see when we come to grid connections and so on. So why I'm uh, sitting here in front of you and doing this speech here, um, because a few years ago, I think in 2014, politicals, uh, politicians in, in Hamburg decided to go for zero emissions. So uh, since 2020, we're not allowed to purchase any emission uh, diesel buses. So only emission-free buses are purchased um, since uh, for a few years now. And um, uh, the target, the objective has been announced that we want to be emission free um, as a whole company and obviously then as an, uh, in our fleet by 2030. So roughly 10 years of time um, for the transformation of our bus fleet, which gives us the rough plan that um, normally we operate a bus when we buy it and until we send it, uh, sell it um, roughly 11 to 13 years. So simply uh, one lifetime of a bus is the time that we take for transforming our fleet. So buses that have been bought in 2019 uh, will be sold in 2030 and not in 2020, just because we want to be mission free. <clears throat> so our way to zero emissions started a few years ago. Um, basically, when I came to the Hochbahn in 2017, this project was um, um, soft resetted, as said, so there were some uh, innovation stuff and uh, a lot of smaller projects like experimental stuff with buses and infrastructure. Um, but in 2017, there was a big new setup for the project and we had a lot of preparation and planning until 20, 2020 when we were forced to leave diesel bus behind and go only for emission free drives. There was a lot of uh, preparation. Um, so we um, purchased the first buses. We purchased first charging units and we had um, our software that uh, we already had in place for the diesel world to be equipped for the electric world. So we had new uh, management systems. We had the um, upgrading of the existing management systems and all this stuff basically was preparing um, for the moment when we are not allowed to buy any diesel buses. So um, since 2020, um, we kind of reached uh, our first goal to not buy any more diesel buses and uh, in the first two years we kind of purchased 100 buses which is as I said roughly 10% of our fleet 
we now um, have two. Today we have three depots, but at the end of 2022, we had two depots to be equipped with uh, electric chargers and we have extended functions of the system. What this basically is, I will tell you in a minute. And uh, we are now in a phase uh, where we left the proof of concept behind. So we had uh, uh, several depots now where we have the grid connection, where we have charges, hundreds of charges, and now 150 buses roughly. And now we're basically at the rollout phase. So we have some more depots to go. We have several hundred buses to go. And uh, we're now going for optimization issues, as I will also tell you in a minute. So leaving the basic functionality that we had to implement, like simply charging the bus um, behind, although we still have issues with this, but we'll see this in a minute, and going for additional functionality, which is quite important for us as a fleet operator and as a part of the uh, decarbonization in the future. So um, then a quick view into the figures. Um, <clears throat> so this is our ramp up plan um, for the next years. Uh, as you can see here now, we have not just 2030, but 2032. Um, this is still under, let's say, discussion. So in the beginning of the project, we had this target that uh, the year, uh, the 13 years of a bus lifetime in, at the Hamburg Hochbahn will be used from 2019 to 2032. Um, but this is not very important for now. So today we're going for um, several um, uh, no, uh, roughly 100 buses a year in order to be transformed fully by the end of 20 of the 2020s or the beginning of 2030s. And um, the main message I want to address here, and that's why I show you this slide, is that you have not just uh, um, the bus figures, which is the dark red one here, but uh, more important even, maybe we can switch to... Um, Laser pointer here. Uh, more important, um, and this has always been a discussion, especially when it comes to funding, um, the number of charges that you have in place. So basically, our target is to provide one charger for every bus. So we have one parking space. This parking space is electrified with a charger, 150 kilowatt, and uh, every bus gets one parking space with one charger. And uh, obviously you have some issues in the very beginning, so not every bus, not every charger is working correctly. You have communication issues. We have we have to rearrange buses. We have to switch between several depots. Uh, you always have issues in the transformation phase, and uh, thus we decided to go for more electrical infrastructure than buses. And as a general rule, we try to implement um, as many charges at the end of the year um, uh, to be able to cover all the supplied buses in the upcoming year. So basically in, at the end of every year, we want to have more charges than at the end of the next year we have buses. This gives us uh, flexibility, but this, um, especially in the beginning, so let's say 2018 to 2020, there has always been a discussion with the government because we have a lot, uh, we have received a lot of fundings. Uh, why do you really need one uh, more than one charger for every bus and then we always had to explain we don't need more than one for a bus but we need more than um, uh, more chargers than buses temporarily in order to be able to cope with all those issues we have in the beginning in order to be flexible in order to maintain our pace when it comes to ordering and uh, supplying buses because if you don't have, have this flexibility you always get limitations and then you have issues in the operation and you don't want this. And as a general rule, we also uh, we, in the beginning, we try to um, always be one year ahead in infrastructure. So that's the main issue, uh, main message from, from the slide. Here we can see a map of Hamburg and our bus depots and the, uh, the green ones uh, are already electrified. So we have number four, Alsterdorf, which is uh, which has been started in operation 2019 as a diesel uh, bus depot, but uh, constantly transforming to electric bus depot. Now we have roughly five of five out of six carports are electrified now or equipped for electric buses and Soon there will be more. So we have now three depots, as you can see, 
we are building new depots because uh, some of our old depots like number one we have to get rid of because it's not our um, our ground here so we uh, are only the lenders of those uh, of those depots and we have to um, find replacements and uh, maybe some of you who are aware of the discussions on or the issues of finding new places for bus depots in the city centers um, quite challenging issue so this comes on top of all the issues for the electrification of the fleet to be order and uh, to be able uh, to be flexible right in the very beginning so if you lose bus depots um, uh, it makes it even more challenging to be ahead in infrastructure to be prepared to yeah to uh, supply your buses when they are delivered and thus uh, this is an issue uh, which is extended uh, which extends the um, simple task of transforming your fleet so <clears throat> the first issue related uh, to strategy now um, i would like to cover battery versus hydrogen and uh, if i were if i had uh, done this presentation a few years ago my judgment on this issue would have been less far less clear um because this was really an issue in 2017 up to 2000, 2020 at least are we going for hydrogen are we going for battery buses and if we are going for battery buses are we going for the depot charging concept buying as much and as big batteries as possible or are we going for the opportunity charging concept you can see all of them here on the slide um, so in the very beginning, as I said, before the project was restarted, we had a lot of innovation stuff, a lot of experimental stuff. We had those pantograph systems um, and pantograph charging experience um, in, in Hamburg in order to find out what, what of those three, which of those three paths is the one that is suitable for us. We also had hydrogen buses, uh, range extender buses or hybrid buses and um, basically we concluded that none of the technologies is really really good <laughs> at least it was 2017 but the the one which is the um, best out of those three is the depot charging concept so by now um, we see a confirmation of the strategy uh, by now at least in germany way more than 90 percent of the buses that are purchased by public transport organizations are um, battery buses with a depot charging concept um there are only a few regional areas which are very um which have a long history with uh, uh, related to hydrogen uh, who go for uh, hydrogen buses and uh, there are also there are always some regional aspects that uh, are in favor for the hydrogen but generally speaking um the the sector is going for battery buses um and uh, this is something that we have faced uh, in the past years and the main reason of course uh, is that the battery ranges uh, increased a lot in the past years so basically um, why we chose the depot charging is is, uh, is marked here so um, from the very beginning we saw that this technology has the highest market availability so the number and the quality of producers and manufacturers that um, uh, were uh, important for us um uh, the best situation was for the battery bus uh, and still for hydrogen buses the the amount of quality of producers is not that broad as as in the battery sector then the technical readiness level trl or production ready technology as i call it here um is quite high now so the the number of buses that are produced uh, in induces that the series technology is quite reliable still of course we have some issues some um, failures some uh, bugs and so on because the technology is still new um, but the technology readiness level compared with the others is quite high so and basically of course uh, here in Hamburg the operational complexity for our um, bus drivers or the planners in the bus sector is quite low if you if you go for the depot charging concept in comparison to the opportunity charging concept you don't have to plan uh, charging in advance uh, when you operate your bus you just have to park it and it is charged overnight or in the mid times uh, mid of the day when you don't need it and that's it and so forth and so on and so forth and still and even in, in infrastructure issues um, you keep all the infrastructure on your own depots so we don't have to worry about pantograph systems and getting spaces for them in the city 
Um, so all these issues account for the fact that we're going for battery buses and depot charging concept. But hydrogen is not out of the game, at least not fully, um, especially um, uh, since the starting of the war one year ago and uh, the vulnerability, vulnerability of supply chains and the transformation, the required transformation of energy systems uh, gave a big boost to hydrogen. And there are some hydrogen projects in the northern of part of Germany as well. And uh, Hochbahn is part of uh, the so-called uh, reality labor uh, laboratory. And um, we are going for hydrogen buses as well. So we buy a small fleet, roughly five buses, in order to not lose our knowledge on those buses we had gained for the uh, decades ago. Um, but we're not seeing this for the trans transformation of the whole fleet, but we want to be flexible. We can see that the uh, energy and the industry sector will be um, will have to be transformed, decarbonized by using um, uh, a lot of hydrogen. And so we think that uh, there's a high chance that hydrogen buses uh, pushed by the hydrogen industry um, might likely become a better option in the future. And uh, thus we want to keep the technology, keep the, knowledge, keep the knowledge, but not going for a full run. So we don't buy and build um, infrastructure on this. We um, use tanks, uh, we use uh, refueling stations on external gas stations. So we don't build them our, ourselves and we only try to keep a small fleet and not going for hundreds of hydrogen buses. But the importance and uh, the relevance of hydrogen for the whole society uh, is out of question but not for public transport, at, at least we think not for public transport related to buses or even cars. <clears throat> on this side, a slide, uh, on this slide, I try to provide um, the insight on our strategic um, discussions we had at the very beginning of the project. So how much range do you really need? And more important, the question, uh, how much range do you really get? And for us as a city um, operator, we see that um, most of the bus operation that we have to provide daily is between 150 and 300 kilometers. So basically, if you if you make it to 250 kilometers of range, um, this is the game changer. You will always have some routes that are longer than 250, but it's not really challenging to transform those uh, bus operations into shorter ones that can be covered by a uh, electric bus that provides 250 or roughly 250 kilometers of range. So the additional costs and the additional buses you need, it's not a game changer. You you want the game, let's say. And um, now the question is, what is the actual uh, range that's provided to us? So we did uh, the the tendering phase in 2020, and since 2020 we saw some improvements of our bus suppliers, which is threefold. So we have Solaris. Evobus and MAN, and um, by now the offers we get, at least for solar buses, are up to 275 kilometers. So here we can say, tick in the box, so this is no more an issue. And for articulated buses, um, ranges have improved as well, but they are not at the objective yet. But still, going for 200 or even more than 200 kilometers, um, by now, gives us the chance to um, to transform most of our daily bus operations from a diesel to an electric bus. Although I have to um, include in this issue that um, by now we are still going for fossil fuel heating in the winter times, so we are not there um, when we come to a fully electric heating in winter times, although it's not that cold in Hamburg in winter times, but we see that um, the ranges that we are provided when we get rid of the fossil fuel heating, um, they decrease to roughly 80 or 85 percent. So still for solar buses, we're going for 230 kilometers of range when we go fully electric in the winter heating. So um, there's not much left for the tipping point, let's say uh, 250 kilometers. So we are quite confident that we will make it um, in the next years. And I, I'm quite sure that uh, there will be some more improvements in battery technology and battery range or bus range 
um, in the upcoming years, making it even easier for going to go for depot charging concept and making hydrogen uh, buses even less important because you can solve your problems uh, with the range with electric buses as well. So much for the strategic allocation and the questions that we discussed a few years ago, discussing uh, going for the one or the other te technology. Now I try to cover um, a few challenges that we see. Um, all in all, we can say that it's a very complex task. Um, there are a lot of issues that you have to take into account. Maybe solutions are even um, less difficult to find nowadays as they were five years ago. But still, there are some issues, uh, technical issues, um, that we can um, still have a lot of work on. And I will try to give you an insight on this. So, um, in the beginning, I tried to show you that we had some uh, preparation and planning in our first phase of the project and preparing our software and hardware infrastructure for being ready for e-buses. And I said, basic functionality, something like charging your bus um, is, well, of, of course, it's uh, it's very important in order to operate your buses. Um, nevertheless, it was quite challenging. So um, I can assure you then that if you buy a bus from one manufacturer and a charger from the other manufacturer um, and you plug them together the first time, you can qu be quite sure that it's not charging um, the, uh, the way you want it. So um, I ha hope this will become better in the future, but uh, the first years were quite disappointing. But still, it's not just the charging. We have uh, um, issues with preconditioning, so we had to find a way to precondition our buses, especially in the winter times, important in order to not lose um, battery range on the road, or in order to um, be forced to use more fossil fuel for our uh, fossil fuel heating in the winter times. So preconditioning is a very important issue has been for uh, since the very beginning. And uh, now we're going for um, um, like well, now we're going for more academic questions, let's say. So it's not the basic bus operation that you have to cover, but uh, improvements and optimizations. So we have to cope with power limitations that we see on the on the bus depots, which was not an issue, of course, if you have the first 10 or 100 buses on a 200 bus depot. Um, a 200 buses bus depot because there's always a lot of power from your grid connection but still in the future when the, the depot will be full of electric buses power limitations will become an issue so your disposition has to improve you have to um you have to cover the the, the buffers that you um that you had in the very beginning where you have less e electric buses you have to get rid of them and find solutions for the limitations that you have on the site and uh for the future, as we found out that batteries are quite expensive, we even go uh, want to go the, the extra mile here. So um, charging our batteries uh, to make them live longer. So providing less battery power, charging power or power when we need it and not just when the buses uh, arrive at the bus depot and then charge them fully as quick as possible. But maybe it's more important. Uh, maybe it's better for the battery um, to charge it later or slowly. Uh, and so on and so forth. So th those are those are issues that we are now discussing and trying to find solutions for the future. And uh, the tools we are using for those, um, always uh, in Hamburg, we always try to go for tools that are standardized. So ISO 15118, um, like from the very beginning, but now still the second edition or the, uh, the dash 20, uh, using bi-directional charging issues and so on, um, was the very, uh, very first uh, standard that we used uh, combined with the OCPP, uh, open, open chart point protocol. Um, we had to um, define new standards, at least for the German sector, so the VDV um, covered uh, in, a, in a, a standard or uh, uh, information for the German um, bus operators public transport operators, the VDV 261, which addresses um, the way preconditioning is done because preconditioning obviously was not an issue for the first edition of the ISO 1518 because in the public car sector, nobody thinks about preconditioning. So we had to find a solution on this and we tried to implement this solution or provide this solution for the whole branch or the sector uh, in order to, well, provide a standard 
that not every company has to find its uh, solution and in the end uh, a bus from Hamburg cannot uh, disc um, be charged in Berlin or manufacturers have to provide uh, several solutions for several cities which is not very convenient. Well, so those are just some uh, some examples we, we we could discuss even more so charging schedules for the future in order to make buses uh, able to go to sleep and um, use less energy when they are stored in the bus depot and so on and so forth. So still a lot of technical issues that can be addressed and solved. But uh, another look on this issue is on the disposition side. So um, as I said, um, there are less issues when you have only a dozen of buses. But when your uh, car park is fully electrified and um, you have uh, buses that have a range of 150 kilometers from the, the old ones, let's say the first you bought, you have buses with a new technology, with another technology, battery technology that have to be dealt with completely different. If you have buses um, with different ranges, different, different manufacturers and all those limitations, um, you might come to the point, um, and we are not there yet, but we can see in the, in, in, uh, in the next years that the complexity of the disposition calculation, so the optimization uh, software uh, has so much limitations and so much um, parameters that have to be uh, accounted for. Um, this results in a um, um, high need for calculation power and you have some more issues um, when you try to integrate even more manufacturers and more different um, functionality. So not just charging, but intelligent charging and so on. So these are all issues that will arise in the next years when you know when you not just want to go for charging, but uh, intelligent charging of your buses and of course intelligent disposition. Then I would like to come back to um, one of the first pages where I addressed that uh, our grid operator here um, in Hamburg is also owned by the city. Um, here you can see the grid connection uh, of one of our first bus depots in Altsdorf. This is actually uh, um, a line that is uh, along or beside the, the bus depot and we simply uh, find the solution to, uh, to connect to this line, although our grid operator, grid operator was not very happy about this, but the um, alternative was waiting five years for the electrification of our bus depot. And um, there it comes into, uh, uh, there uh, we had the first um, issue that it was very convenient that both companies are owned by the public um, and by the city of Hamburg in order to find a interim solution uh, to make us able to connect with the grid in order to operate our buses, roughly 100 buses on this bus depot now, um, and not just waiting for five years. But still, um, this is quite, quite important to, to be addressed, that uh, you have long times, preparation and planning times, up to five years or even six years when you're in city uh, areas until you get a grid connection, depending on how big uh, your power needs are, but um, we have a lot of high power requirements and thus high voltage grid connection uh, in this case. So not just medium voltage, but even high voltage um, might take up uh, up to several years. And uh, this is a quite challenging process um, if you have to plan five years in advance and don't and you don't even know which bus depot, which uh, ranges of buses, which manufacturer of buses will be there in five years ago, uh, in five years time. With the grid connection, there comes load management. As I said, uh, if you have only 10 or 20 or 50 buses on a bus depot um, and you want to store up to 200 buses on one bus depot, grid connection might not be an issue, but when you have them all fully electrified, there is an issue or there will be an issue. So load management will become an issue in the future. Um, although we found out that load management uh, also includes simply communication, uh, communi communi communicating with the buses, and uh, this can be quite challenging as well. So as I said, ISO 15118, all those standards, um, making the bus talk to your back end system, making the bus talking to your charger is not, um, plug and play issue. 
Um, so we had a lot of efforts here to do. Um, but so originally thinking load management, of course, uh, means how can you distribute your power to the buses accordingly uh, in an optimized way. You don't have to charge your buses um, uh, fully uh, at the moment where it comes back home, although it's a convenient and very easy way to implement in the very beginning. So obviously this is something like the um, first case you you try to implement because it's easy because it's convenient for your bus operation as well. It provides you flexibility, but uh, this can be uh, um, the way you do it or when you electrify your whole fleet. And thus you have to transform your system and equip your system in order to be ready for those issues as well. And uh, uh, we have some interesting findings here um, from uh, a study a few years ago um, where we tried to find out um, we have a lot of we had a lot of power demand. We have uh, the grid connection that we have, um, that we uh, were provided by our grid operator. But uh, one of the questions was, is the the figure that we chose in the very beginning, so we provide 150 kilowatt for each bus. Uh, is this figure uh, a suitable one, or may it be a better solution to provide less charging power or more charging power? And here you can see the results of one of our uh, studies that we did a few years ago. So if you provide 50 kilowatt charges to every bus, um, obviously all the buses use those 50 kilowatt. But as you can see, um, the number of charging points you require, which is equal to the number of buses you have to operate, is quite high. So you can save, obviously save buses and charges if you provide more charging power because you don't have to wait until the bus is fully charged and don't have to send another bus. And uh, But this, uh, this decrease uh, is even smaller when you go from 100 kilowatt to 150 and so on and so forth. So the amount of buses you save or you spare when you go increase your charging power um, reduces with every kilowatt you provide. And uh, thus you have to find uh, a trade-off solution, let's say. So there are some buses who really need the 150 kilowatt uh, charging power in order to be ready for the next uh, bus route, but most of them don't need it. So here you can see the example that um, at least two thirds of the buses you provide 150 kilowatt with, they don't need it. They are um, f completely fine with 50 kilowatt. Some of them use the 100 kilowatt because they need it for the um, readiness for the next uh, bus route, and some even use the 150 kilowatt, but not all of them. And uh, this even uh, gets less important when you increase to the pantograph systems here in 300 kilowatt areas. So um, basically, you could provide 300 kilowatt pantograph systems for all your buses, but you don't need it. So there are only a few buses that really use this charging power, um, and this is not convenient. Huh? So the figure 150 kilowatt um, is quite a good figure, and uh, yeah, a good trade-off. Some other findings. Um, um, in order to calculate how big the grid connection um, has to be when you transform your diesel bus depots into electric bus depots. Uh, we had a university working on this a few years ago, 2016 even. So basically they, they had to calculate how much megawatt we need at our bus depots using different uh, charging, um, charging parameters. So using slow charging or optimized charging or simply dump charging, charging the bus uh, as quick as possible, and so on. And uh, those were the first results that made the whole one available to find out, okay, how, how big is the grid connection that we have to provide for our buses? Um, how big is the importance of a load management system that is applied to the buses? And here you can see, so two different um, approaches for charging the buses make a huge impact on the grid connection that you uh, require. So in this case, we had 150 buses with a charging power of 150 kilowatt. And dependent on the charging uh, strategy, you have uh, 11 megawatt or 50 megawatt of uh, a grid connection. And this is quite important. Uh, and this, um, those were the first findings that um, were used to dimension the infrastructure on a global and a um, smaller scale in order to yeah, get some figures that you 
uh, use in order to provide electricity first to the first buses. And the last um, challenge I would like to discuss or I would like to uh, address to you is um, the issue with the sustainability of the supply chains. So whom of you do actually know um, where your raw materials for your batteries come from? Um, whom of you does really know what is the global impact of your actions? So what is the global impact related to social sustainability? So who is actually getting those raw materials out of the uh, out of the earth? How much CO2 is um, um, polluted during this process? How much water is used? How much uh, depletion or whatever um, chemicals is used um, in those processes? And uh, this all leads to the um, to the need for um, transparency in your supply chain. And um, this is an absolutely new topic, um, maybe for most of the sectors, um, but especially for public transport operators, because uh, in the past, at least in Germany, nobody has ever thought on, on this. Um, where do our buses come from? Where did our diesel come from? Nobody asked this question. But in the future, we will be asked the question, where do your batteries come from? And can you ensure that there's not a single kid that dig, dug out the cobalt uh, in the mines in the Congo in order to build your bus? And yeah, so this is uh, one of the new questions that we have to address, uh, one of the challenges that we, that we fight in the upcoming years and for the past, uh, last years as well. So, so far, no questions. Um, and I will keep on there talking is a, forever. There is a couple of questions. There is, the there chat. is. Yes, yes, we can do this. Uh, I think now is a good time okay. before we move on to figures. Yes. Mm -hmm. The first one was from Uli from, uh, from AMB. Uh, Barcelona, he was asking, but you already replied. But uh, Uli, just just uh, yeah, take the word if, uh, if you need more clarification. The question was, what is the time required for implementation of a charging point since you decide until it's, it, it is in service? Yep. So I think you already we covered can, this, but... Uh, yeah, uh, well, we can... I discussed uh, the grid connection, which is four to six years. But when we're talking about the sim simple charger, um, to, uh, at Hochbar we calculate roughly two years. So we have uh, the tendering phase, we have the pre-planning uh, pre planning phase for the um, um, the medium voltage, so all the switches, all the fuses and so on. And uh, then we have the planning phase for the actual charges uh, and tender phases and so on, and we end up with roughly two years. So one year of population and planning and tendering, and one year of uh, building and uh, taking into operation. Super, thank so far, so good. you. Then we have another question uh, from Christian Buckman from VBC. Uh, how satisfied are you with the interaction between the uh, bus manufacturer and the charging infrastructure or the charging points. How high is the failure rate due to the charging interruptions? Könnte besser sein. Uh, could be better. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have, we still have a lot of issues uh, like uh, um, charging failures. So charging sessions simply fail due to whatever reasons um, for all bus and all um, infrastructure suppliers. So we see those issues for Solaris, we see, see those issues for Everbus. And when you plug them to um, the uh, Heliox, if you plug them to the Siemens, to the ABBs, um, we uh, had to implement some workarounds. So one example might be today, if there is a, a loss of connection, so a failure in the charging, uh, we simply make a restart an automated restart for the charging process up to five times in order to be sure that at the very next morning every bus is fully charged and this kind of works but this can't be the solution for forever just an interim and the same for preconditioning we have still failures for preconditioning um, i think up to or roughly 75 percent of preconditioning is uh, successful by now which leaves 25% of preconditioning being not successful. 
Um, and as well, there are several issues on this. So there might be some faulty buses, there might be some shitty manufacturers, but there are still some uh, or several bugs that are in in those issues. Yeah. From my side, then a question on that: um, Is there any um, any proposal to to address these issues with uh, both the charging infrastructure and the bus manufacturers directly? Um, we started um, working on those issues by uh, taking both. Uh, manufacturers at one table, so uh, not discussing with the un one and then discussing with the other one. We made um, we brought brought them together, and we made them responsible for a solution. So um, there there's no way of one manufacturer saying, "Well, it's not my fault. There's an infrastructure fault. I'm not responsible for this." Um, we don't accept this. So we make them both accountable for providing the functionalities that we need and um, you can't solve this on your own. So you always have to uh, to um, work with your manufacturers and you have to make them work together. Um, fortunately, we um, now have a, lo a long year tradition with our manufacturers, bus side and uh, infrastructure side. So they already know each other and it's, it's, it's working quite well. Um, but you get, if you get new um, suppliers, either side, it, it, I'm quite sure it will be a mess. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Marcus. Another question from uh, Daniel uh, Villeneuve. Uh, are you using in the plug chargers or Panto? Uh, in Depot, we only use the plug charging. And you have some opportunity charging with uh, Panto down now? On, on we have street. some relics, yes, as you saw on the picture, but we are actually not going <laughs> for them anymore. So it was just uh, innovation and experimental phase. So we are not going for Pantograph system anymore. Perfect. There, there are no questions uh, uh, in the chat anymore. We can continue mm -hmm. uh, after you've <clears throat> finished. Yes, thanks. If you have more questions, just, just ask and I'll try to provide some answers. Now we come to costs. May it be a bit more also already indicates that it's not well. Increasing costs that we face uh, when it comes to e-mobility. Um, and uh, we try to cover uh, the most important aspects when it comes to um, costs for the whole diesel system, uh, the whole bus system, so not just the bus itself, but the overall system. And as you can see here now, we have covered um, bus drivers, we have covered uh, fuel versus electricity and so on. We also have um, infrastructure costs and we have bus costs. And uh, as you can see, so, uh, the very first place, so we have the reference, a diesel bus, 100%. Um, and if we assume that there are no additional vehicles we have to buy, so the ranges that we have today provide us uh, the solution that we don't have to buy additional buses because the range is sufficient. If you assume that this is the case for battery and for fuel cell buses, we still see that uh, costs for battery buses are roughly 20% higher for the overall system and for fuel, uh, fuel cell buses even up to 40% um, more expensive. And the reasons uh, are, well, there are several reasons for this. Um, obviously, the costs for the bus drivers are the same. Uh, thus, 48% with respect to the diesel buses uh, stays constant. Um, obviously, we can save some um, money accounting for the emissions. So this is quite surprising, maybe. Um, we uh, try to monitorize uh, CO2 emissions here with 215 euros per ton CO2. So obviously, we save a lot of CO2 emissions and thus we can save money by this, um, but we can also save uh, money from um, for, uh, by using electricity. So electricity is cheaper than diesel, but you can see that hydrogen, at least for nowadays, is way more expensive than uh, electricity and even diesel. <coughs> the orange um, one we can see uh, are the additional costs for um, inefficient uh, bus operation, let's say. So um, this is when you 
drive from the bus depot to the very starting point of your line. And in the beginning, everybody thought, oh my God, when we use electric buses, we have to, to cut all the bus uh, routes and we have to shorten them in order to make them flexible enough for battery buses with limited ranges. And there are so much, there's so much inefficiency because we have to get uh, away from our optimized operating point that this is very costly, very expensive. And we can see now this is not the case. So, um, 5% of the costs account for the inefficient bus driving, so from the bus depot to your starting point. And when you're in the bus, uh, in the electric bus world, it's 6%. So there is an increase. You have some more empty rides, but it's not the game changer. There are some issues that are way more important, and this is definitely the costs of the buses, as you can see here. So we split it up here to uh, maintenance costs. Oh assumed maintenance costs in the years uh, to come and the uh, purchasing costs um, for the vehicle and in the electric buses or the um, fuel cell buses, we split them even up even further. So here we have the body, vehicle body for the electric bus and here the cost for the battery or batteries, plural, um, because we assume that we will need two batteries uh, for the bus lifetime. And here you can see 10 versus 32. We are right uh, at uh, three times the price we have to pay for the bus, including the batteries um, with uh, com compared to the diesel world. And this is the game changer. This is the reason why electric buses are, electric bus systems are so expensive. It's simply because the buses are so expensive. And if you have to buy two batteries because um, uh, one battery will not make it for 10 or 12 years, um, you have to buy the most expensive part of the bus twice. And this even more increases the costs and thus, uh, this is what really makes, at the moment, electric bus operation quite expensive compared to diesel. What, the, what is not a, a question? Question, yeah. Marcus, please. Sorry, Victor uh, Victor Wook from VI is asking why is the maintenance cost uh, higher for e buses? Um, I have to um, admit that I don't know exactly. These are just figures that are provided by the uh, uh, colleagues from the workshop. So I, I'm sorry, I can't go into detail on this. I'm sorry. Maybe it's uh, increased um, costs for yeah. the, the warranty that have been uh, addressed in the in the contracts, um, but I'm, I'm, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, no worries. We can take uh, also that reply afterwards. Um, what we are always assuming is obviously that the maintenance for of, of electric buses uh, is supposed to be cheaper or lower, definitely than the, than the diesel ones. Mm -hmm. But um, there is uh, there is not many figures uh, available um, that the operators can compare. This is true. I saw Manel's yeah. I saw Manel's hand also rising. I don't know if you have raised your hand. I see another question in the meantime from Gert Schap, uh, e bus and battery, uh, 18 to, to 25 in our case, uh, so much lower than you have. Yeah, I guess it differs from, from operator to operator indeed. Sorry, I didn't get the question. What the comment? What was, what was it, it? It was a comment. It was a, a contribution. Sorry, uh, from Gert Schap, uh, uh, e-bus plus battery, uh, eighteen to twenty-five in our case. So much lower than the figures mm -hmm. you have. But uh, as I said, I think I it, it it differs from operator to operator, obviously. And at mm -hmm. the end, the TCO is not a fixed uh, methodology, right? I mean, everyone. Uh, tries to adapt it to the to the local context. This is what but we actually got the prices for. I don't know if you if you're referring yeah. to percentage in your case, because if you take 32 out of 121, it's roughly 25%. So maybe we end up the same figure roughly. But um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. No, I'm, I'm just please. Yes, no, I, can, I can explain it now, but uh, we also procure our own buses uh, directly. So and um, we 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 have seen that the the price for a diesel uh, for a for a electric bus is let's say double as for a normal bus, um, including a replacement battery uh, guarantee. Um, so that's much better than the price you have. So if you have mm -hmm. ten for a diesel bus, 
you would expect something like 2021 20, for uh, electric bus, including uh, potential battery replacement in a lifetime of, let's say, uh, 12 years or 14 years. So, but uh, that also is kind of uh, improved under time and the lifetime of the battery has also improved, uh, we've seen. So yeah. uh, at least that's what, what they promise, um, but it's up to battery, battery, let's say, can perhaps grow from the lifetime uh, is sometimes we get like, say, seven uh, up to 10 years guarantee. So it's mm. getting better and better. Yeah. Mm. Thanks a lot, Hert. If no further questions, comments now, we can continue, Marcus. Thank you. Just one last remark from my side. So. Infrastructure costs are not really important or not the game changer when it comes to system costs in total. As you can see here, the figures four, um, for all the electric infrastructure, so the grid connection, the carports that you build, um, all the charges uh, due to the long lifetime, um, they don't really uh, matter compared to the vehicle costs. OK, so far, um, there are so much for the costs. Um, and what do we get for those costs? So how much CO2 can be saved or spared? Um, as I said, Hopon tries to be climate, climate neutral by 2030. And that's why we try to transform our bus fleet by 2030, obviously. Um, what we use for our buses is high quality green electricity. Um, and uh, those uh, CO2 emissions that we can't avoid, like heating in our buildings, um maybe we try to uh, we have to try to find some compensation for this but actually the most important part of getting climate neutral obviously is transforming the bus fleet to emission free buses um but still it's not ju just the bus itself it's also the infrastructure and this is uh, an example that i would like to show you so if you <clears throat> take into account the infrastructure um build phase let's say and all the charges that you have to provide for the operation for the bus, as we did here, you have to, well, you, you are able to um, build up a system life cycle analysis, as you can see here. So we have the transformer station, we have this, the medium voltage supply, we have the carports, so the concrete in the carports as well, and the charges them, themselves, and all this uh, can be taken into account as well. And here you can see the results. So luckily, um, with reference to the diesel bus, we can save CO2. And all the figures that we show here are very conservative figures. So um, um, all the emissions that are still assumed when it comes to infrastructure, which is again yellow, which is not very important. So all the concrete, all the charges still used for a very long time do not account a lot for the uh, overall CO2 emissions. All those figures are very conservative, and especially when it comes to the batteries. And as you can see here, the biggest uh, block that is left for the actual battery buses that we operate today with the fossil fuel heating, um, besides obviously the fossil fuel of the heating, is the production of the batteries. And uh, we used um, figures from a study, from a Swedish study from 2019, um, which addresses uh, 146 kilowatt, uh, kilogram CO2 per kilowatt hour of a battery capacity, of battery energy. Um, so very conservative assumption, which was the worst, worst, worst figure once in 2019. And we still end up with roughly 27 or 25%. So we can spare three quarters of um, CO2 emissions over lifetime with the first generation of battery buses. Um, when we go for fuel cell buses, obviously the batteries are way, uh, way smaller and thus we have less CO2 emissions for the battery. Uh, we still have some for the fuel cell system, but um, you can save even more CO2 when you use, uh, when you go for the battery, uh, for the hydrogen bus. But even more here is, it is important that you go for green hydrogen and at least in Germany, the uh, availability of green hydrogen is not that sufficient, let's say. So we are not there yet. Maybe in the future when there will be green hydrogen everywhere, then this is really actually what you can save. So up to 90%. But we also want to address that with batteries, obviously there is something uh, more 
possible to go. So obviously you can get rid of the fossil fuel heating. And if you once make it to green batteries, then you end up with roughly the same um, CO2 savings uh, like for the hydrogen buses. And this is basically key, basically the, the message that I want to address here uh, with this slide. But to be honest, to, to draw a bigger picture, let's skip this. Um, in the end, it's all about where does your hydrogen and your electricity come from. Um, here you can see the comparison between different colors of hydrogen, so yellow hydrogen, which is uh, electrolyzes, um, electrolyzed hydrogen in the U electricity, so a mixture of coal, of uh, whatever. And uh, there you can see that this, this is even worse than using diesel buses. And obviously there's only two options, so going for green hydrogen for fuel cell buses and green electricity for battery buses. All the rest you can really, well, leave it out because there's no use. There's no benefit for benefit of using um, other um, energy sources. But this should be quite obvious um, to everybody. OK, so we are exceeding time um, and one chapter to go. Aida, what do you want me to do? Go on and... Think, uh, we, yeah, we continue uh, and uh, I think the participants will give us uh, five, uh, six minutes more. I think we can, then I use, we can then cope I with use that. Five minutes. Yes, okay. thank you everyone. So social and global sustainability. Um, Hochbahn started thinking about transparency of supply chains a few years ago. Um, we made some basic, uh, um, we did some basic uh, stuff like going for a code of conduct for our suppliers and business partners, but um, especially for the electric buses where the overall risk is the battery and the raw materials in the battery, we did a specific uh, risk analysis and evaluation process. And um, even in 2020, on our tendering for the battery buses, the, fir the very first time for German public transport operators, we included sustainability criteria in our tendering and even in the evaluation matrix. So in the end, it was decisive. Um, you could get points or not if you have a sustainable bus and manufacturing process or not. And 10% um, of the evaluation matrix have been uh, accounted for sustainability, which doesn't sound that much, but in comparison, the overall price, uh, so the selling price for the bus was only 30%. So this is the dimension that we're talking about. So sustainability is a really important issue and will be an even more important issue for us in the future. And uh, we had a lot of chats with our bus, bus manufacturers, with those who sell buses to us and with those who don't yet. And um, we have to uh, state that um, they're at the very beginning of this process. So obviously most of uh, the big concern, uh, um, companies that also sell cars are aware of the fact that they have the same issues for the lithium, for the manganese, for the cobalt, for whatever, for even for copper. Um, with cars as well, and they are working on this, but we're far away from an actual green battery where we can really be sure that the raw materials are um, extracted in a, a child labor free way and in a CO2 um, reduced way. So we're in the beginning of discussions. We are seeing that none of the German um, public transport operators has asked or even um, included those issues um, and questions in their tendering yet. But we um, luckily we were able to convince some of our partners in the past years to do so, to go this way together with us. And now we're at the verge of uh, fighting for, let's say, standardization of this issue as well. So not standard, not only standards for uh, communication protocols between buses, buses and charges, but also for um, uh, fighting for standards for the um, sustainability criteria. So in order to be sure that um, buses that are sold to Munich, to Hamburg, to Berlin, to whatever, to Paris, to London, to Barcelona, um, if you have something like a certificate um, uh, that this bus is really a green bus, and, and you can be sure that if you have this kind of certificate, 
then there were some audits, then there is a third party that ensures you that this bus, this battery, the raw materials in the battery, and so on and so forth are green, are sustainable, and uh, yes, so this is kind of the target, and we're quite sure, well, we're quite aware of the fact that Hofbahn will not be able to change the world in this issue, but we're looking to our politicians uh, in Berlin and in Brussels, and we are uh, seeing the positive um, improvements of the battery directive of the battery passes that are going to come in the next, next year's um, <clears throat> transparency laws um, relying to uh, supply chains in Germany and in, in Europe as well. So this is actually the road where we have to go. And um, we as Hochbahn, we try to uh, to give it, to go the road even quicker and uh, far, farther, but um, well, if uh, politicians support us with the uh, actual framework we need, the, the better. And if some of you even want to join us and uh, improve sustainability and transparency and so on in their supply chains, in your supply chains, then feel free to get in contact with us um, and try to fight this way, uh, try to fight this issue with us conjointly. Um, because the more um, demand is um, uh, um, related to sustainable demand, the more um, incentive the manufacturers have to provide sustainable buses and not just electric buses. And that's it. And I can spare the outlook now for now, but uh, if you have any more questions and issues, feel free to ask and make some comments. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Marcus. I think definitely there is a, there is a, a very nice, uh, let's say, in the next challenges. You you cover you cover many of them, but yeah, exploring and setting up, defining the sustainability aspects of uh, of the transition no, to zero emissions is is one of them. I am sure uh, our colleagues uh, in the Nordic countries, um, we have uh, Victor and, and Gert uh, with us today. They, they are also dealing with the same uh, with the same issues and already have experience in this. So I think that that would be also a nice exchange, perhaps uh, for for next uh, next webinars or next opportunities. But um, from our side, uh, definitely uh, many many thanks for for this very complete uh, uh, presentation on how uh, how Hopan is 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 following uh, this path, this very ambitious path, and. And not losing the the perspective and the 360 degrees. No, we have to look all the aspects and not just uh, implementing buses and taking care of the charging. It goes farther beyond. I think it's a it's a wonderful ex uh, example of how the transition really needs to look like. And uh, I see in the chat the comments, very clear presentation, exactly as we see it. So you are not Thank alone you. there, which I think it, it's always uh, it's always very uh, comforting. Uh, from Uli as well. Uh, very interesting. Many thanks. Uh, yeah, so very good positive feedback. Um, I would then ask everyone if you should have um, any other question. Of course, thanks Francesco also. Very good presentation. Congratulations, Marcus. If you have more questions, uh, just uh, reach out to me and I will be passing the questions to Marcus. But uh, for today, unfortunately, we are, we are a bit over time, but I think the, the presentation and the discussion uh, was more than worth it. So thanks everyone for the patient and, and the extra time. And thanks, of course, Marcus, to you for, for the very nice presentation and sharing with us your, your experience. Um, that would be it from our side. Uh, we keep it uh, here. Uh, just check your inbox for next invitations. Of course, we have upcoming LCA following on the topic today. LCA for e-buses. Upcoming, uh, you will receive the present um, the invitations very soon. So let's uh, let's keep tuned for recording and uh, slides as usual on the website. And uh, yeah, now again, thank you. thanks a lot, Marcus. Uh, big applause. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, You're we welcome. connect in the next uh, in the next webinar. Super. See you soon. Bye bye. Thank back. you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.